incredibly difficult. I mean, it, clearly we have to keep um, a close eye on uh, the Kremlin enablers. You know, there, there is, of course, some pretty solid support for this one, this special military operation. There are many uh, members of the Russian armed forces who have committed atrocities now. But again, not everybody has done this. And so I do think that we have to bear in mind that over the longer term, and that's, you know, sometimes still off in the foreseeable future, we will have to re-engage. Now, a lot of people, I mean, we've heard Macron talk about don't humiliate Russia. I think that that's a, you know, because it might turn out to be like Weimar Germany. We're already beyond that. I mean, Russia has gone through its Weimar period and we're already in the, you know, full on, you know, invasion of Poland plus. And if we're thinking about a World War II analogy, I mean, Russia and Putin have only humiliated themselves. But there is a point of over the longer term that, you know, we can't ignore that Russia is there. And short of a complete and utter loss of war and an occupation of Russia, which of course didn't happen during the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, and you know, is unlikely to have happened in, in this case too, it's going to be very hard to get Russians to come to terms with what they've done. And we'll only be able to do that by engaging, you know, with people who genuinely see things differently. Uh, you know, I think the German and the Japanese um, experience of you know, kind of coming to terms with uh, imperial excess and wartime atrocities, of course, happened under circumstances of occupation. And, you know, we can engage with the Germans and Japanese and others to kind of think about that, because at some point, the Russians are going to have to come to terms with, as they tried to during the Gorbachev period, an early Yeltsin period, you know, with what has happened in here, because otherwise you're going to have generations of enmity, you know, to, to overcome, not just with the Ukrainians, but with most of Europe as well, which is not going to be sustainable for Russia over the longer term. This isn't a great, you know, kind of answer here, but I think we have to think about this, as you've already laid out in different terms. There's not a, one single approach. I think we have short, medium and long term issues that we have to factor in here. Yes, and I, I think that this business of, of trying to move towards a post-imperial Russia, a Russia that's a, an actual nation state and doesn't define itself in terms of controlling um, other groups either within its borders or um, beyond them is an admirable long-term goal. It's very hard to see how we get there at the moment, barring a catastrophic military defeat. Right. And, and of course, the problem with that is that um, if Putin winning is very scary, Putin losing is pretty scary as well, yeah. because um, you mentioned in that um, foreign policy article I referred to at the beginning, his favorite story about the cornered rat. And if you did have a 1918-style military disintegration where an overstretched, under-resourced military starts shooting its officers, going home, mutinying, um, and you see a bit of a military collapse going on, even in parts of, perhaps not all the front, but on, in, in bits of it, that would be a ch an existential threat to Putin where he might then really? try, and es try and escalate. And I'm wondering yeah. how you, and, and, and this is in a way one of the great bogeymen, if um, in 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 the Western discourse is, oh my goodness, Putin's so crazy, we don't know what he'd do. So we better better not not quote humiliate unquote, and we we can't afford to have Putin losing. So how should we think about this danger of, of escalation? Is it is it as real as some of the fear mongers and doom mongers make out? Well, first of all, he's not crazy. Um, you know, we've had Putin around now for twenty two years. Um, I mean, I think many people who are listening to this too have you know kind of made some assessments of him in all this time. We actually know a lot more about him than we used to. And you have to remember that, you know, as you said here, a lot of these stories that we hear about Putin are stories that he himself has put forward because he wants to create a certain image. The story of the rat is his own story that he tells, you know, uh, journalists for his semi-autobiographical book that is his campaign book for being uh, cemented in the position of president back in 99, 2000. And a lot of the stories about Putin's risk taking and you know, the kind of assessments of him come from that, from this kind of creating a certain image that he has to live up to. Now, you know, he's also a rational actor in his own rationale, in his own context. You know, people remember that, you know, um, Angela Merkel said that he's a man who lived in his own world, which doesn't mean that, you know, he lives in an alternate universe. He lives in a, a carefully framed and calculated uh, context of his own, with uh, his own sets of assessments here. Just like, a, you know, I said before, he actually probably assesses he's not doing that badly in the war, uh, where we would look at it from our own perspective and think, well, that's nuts. <laughs> I mean, he, he hasn't achieved any of his original goals. But Putin always, again, is the operative, somebody who 
uh, was a contingency planner thinks, okay, well, I have my, I have my goals. I have my strategic perspectives here. And if the first thing doesn't work, then I'll just try another thing and then I'll try another thing. It's adaptation. He always tells you stories about adaptation as well. Like water, if it can't get down one channel, it'll find another. And so he's always, you know, finding another way, uh, to get to the, uh, get to the same point. Now, if that way, then as you're suggesting, if things start to look a little dire, you know, we've already, seen them do the nuclear saber rattling i mean in many respects he's already rhetorically deployed nuclear weapons and used them because he's got everybody scared and running around so we have to you know bear in mind that that's the kind of thing he does so how do we get ahead of it um one of the um things that uh, is worth bearing in mind for example is that they take a very careful read of us and about how we react so we think about when they move through the chernobyl exclusion zone uh, the, the military forces Putin was paying attention to the fact that everybody said, oh, they wouldn't possibly go through Chernobyl. Why would they do that? I mean, that, that's just horrific. I mean, why would they think about doing that? So of course, they go all the way through. And this scare the heck out of, of everyone by not just stirring up the dust, the toxic dust that's going to actually, you know, probably create a whole host of cancer cases and all of the young conscripts that were sent through that. But it's it's basically stirs up the dust of time. People like me and you and others, you know, who remember the Chernobyl um, explosion and the fact that we were all irradiated in Europe with the plume going over. And so everybody's fears about nuclear power and how that can go wrong get stirred up again. Same thing with Zaporizhia, the largest nuclear plant in Europe. They deliberately shelled it, deliberately shelled it. That wasn't an accident. And th the timing was, of course, so opposite because this was in the uh, period when the Germans are debating whether they extend the life of their nuclear plants you know, to try to offset these problems that they're going to face with natural gas coming in uh, from uh, Russia. And similarly, the Japanese are trying to figure out whether they kind of rev up again their nuclear power system, notwithstanding all the fears from Fukushima. And of course, Germany and Japan are tied together uh, in this kind of nuclear reaction after that uh, explosion and accident after the tsunami in Japan with Fukushima. And so all of this is happening at the same time because Putin knows he can push our buttons. He knows our fears and he can play to our fears. So we then have to get ahead of this. We have to have a serious open discussion about it and we have to figure out how we're going to tackle it in uh, before anything happens. And so I think that that's the only way to deal with it, is to talk about it, talk about it calmly, uh, lay it all out and to realize that this guy is pushing our buttons because in a psychological operation, the things that Putin was trained to participate in, you defeat the enemy before you even get to the battlefield. Now, in this case, yeah. he hasn't quite managed that. But the whole idea is that you tell everybody you can't possibly win, give up now. And that's just basically what he's trying to tell us. Yeah. I want to come to questions in a moment. There are many excellent questions and also a daunting list of Russia experts who've tuned into our discussion, um, many of whom would be um, we could um, probably listen, listen to for many minutes or, or indeed hours. But I, 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 one of the things, I, I, my final question before we get on to, on, on to the wider discussion is that I, I find so frustrating that we are always doing things too late. And I'm yeah. wondering if you could just we could just spool back to February the 24th or indeed February the 23rd. We put tens of billions of dollars of support, financial support into Ukraine, probably not enough because Ukraine's in a parlous state. We put enormous efforts into military supplies. We put sweeping sanctions on Russia. Um, none of it's really worked. We've averted disaster. We haven't got victory. It, it's really quite galling to think if, if one tenth of that political energy have been devoted to the problem beforehand, um, presumably it would have deterred Putin and this wouldn't have happened. Well, yes, I, I mean, I think that's a fair point because, I mean, we, we know um, from long experience and you know, everybody likes to quote the idea of the axiom of Lenin, you know, you kind of push and if you kind of, you know, essentially get mush, you keep on going. And if you hit something hard, you know, with a bayonet, then you stop. If you hit steel, you pull back. Um, I haven't put that as quite as artfully as it's normally quoted, it's but I mean, it's bone. Idea. I think if you if you yes, exactly. it, it's bone. Stops. Yeah, exactly. I've, 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 not, we, not we, steel, we, we, basically. Anyway, it's a nasty, it's a nasty image, anyway. But I mean, basically, yeah. we know that you know, kind of, they will keep on Putin and the people around him. Again, as an operative, will keep on trying, and you know, if you kind of succeed, you keep on going, and then when you stop, you um, you um, fall back. But you know, the the thing is that they um, Putin and the Kremlin have an incredible advantage over all of us because he's been in power again for 22 years essentially with the same cast of characters around him just moving seats he doesn't have a free media anymore he doesn't really have any kind of opposition 
And there's no compulsion, you know, every time he has a new administration, so to speak, or a new term in office to shuffle people around. Think about how many US presidents, prime ministers of, you know, Italy, for example, you know, other places that uh, Putin has gone through in all of this time. We are democracies, we're very messy, we're not very stable. You know, we have uh, changes of administration in places like the United States. We then, you know, kind of have to go cycle through all kinds of political appointees. Many people are not um, actually in place. We have ambassadors who are not in place. Uh, if you think back to the Trump administration, multiple national security advisors and, you know, secretaries of state and secretaries of defense, we haven't got any continuity. We drop mm -hmm. the ball. We lose sight of the ball all the time. That um, is actually the main obstacle for us to be able to put in um, some consistent process that means that Putin always hits bone or steel all the way along. And of and course, we now know that he's trying to game all of this out. He said it openly that he actually believes that new elites will come into power. We've had Mario Draghi's government fall in Italy. We've had, of course, Marine Le Pen um, emerge more successfully out of the French yeah. elections. We're having uh, prime ministerial you know, changeover and potentially you know, kind of more upheaval in the United Kingdom. We have the midterms in the United States. Putin basically figures out that, yes, I mean, the reason that democracies lose focus is because they're always kind of changing over all the time. And we don't yeah. have systems put in place to basically deal with this in a consistent fashion.